Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and we are happy to talk about what friends get to do. This is pod, this podcast is going to be a lot like what Scott and I get to do for fun, is bring you information about whiskey and, and the conversation that happens when you get a bunch of friends together and actually make a whiskey brand yourself. So we are joined by Mac Machovich, co-owner and partner of Art of Alchemy. So Mac, thanks for joining the Bourbon Lens. Thanks for having me. Excited to, to have the time to speak with you. Yeah. No, it's, it's great to have you here. And it's great to have connections, right? So we were catching up before the show. This was introduction by way of a, another uh, person that was on the podcast, Jake from Preservation, uh, their national salesperson. Uh, is met you at a, at a tasting and, uh, you know, kind of sparked your interest. And, and Jake shared how good of a friends he was with you and set us all up. And here we are a couple months later, uh, you know, doing the podcast. So that's how Scott and I came to, to, to be friends as a friend reached out and said, Hey, let's do a podcast. And here we are almost five years later. All about connections, right? Connections and good whiskey, right? Yeah. Amen to that part. Scott, does it, does it still amaze you that we're coming up on five years as, as bourbon lens? Uh, yes. <laughs> and cause every time somebody asks how long you've been doing it, I'm, I'm like, um, oh, just a couple of years, like two years, something like that. And I'm like, wait, we've got 200 and, 13 episodes right now. So yeah, it's uh time flies. Yeah. It's uh it's fun. So, you know, speaking of just like timing, right? So you you meet Jake and one of their former employees not too long long ago. You know, talk about the timeline of when that was. When did you all kind of start to gauge the interest in in making uh, Art of Alchemy come to life? Yeah, well, I've got to take you back a couple of steps. Um, so when I met Jake and, and the preservation team when they were out in Denver, Colorado, um, at that time, my wife and I were actually uh, going down the path of, of literally starting our own distillery here in Colorado. And uh, we had uh, gone under contract with a consulting firm uh, to kind of investigate this and and see you know exactly what it would entail to you know, soup to nuts, you know, the, um, you know, everything from the mash bill to buying real estate and, you know, then doing obviously your, your um, stills and it's going to be pot stills, column stills, whatever it was. Um, so we got into it and the way I had kind of presented this and working with this group for months, um, you know, it kind of outlined what, where I wanted to go with this. And uh, just to be perfectly blunt, the, the, price tag was coming back, you know, around $5 million. And my wife and I are like, okay, you know, all right, we're going to have to really think about this. Well, then I started tweaking things. And this was the original plan was to, to use smaller barrels. And I said, you know, I started thinking to myself and my wife likes to drink whiskey just as much as I do, which is awesome. Um, but I, you know, started talking to her and I was like, you know, everything that I've ever had, any brown juice I've ever had has come out of a 53, 53 gallon, you know, barrel. And I was, you know, I was like, I want to go back to the team and, you know, go to move it to 53 gallon barrels. And Scott, the guy that uh, was, was working with us at the time, he said, you understand this is going to dramatically change everything because you're going to have to age it longer. The barrels cost more, et cetera, et cetera. And so I said, yeah, but just, you know, for giggles, just, plug it into the, to the model. And then the model came back at about 15 million, 17 million. And we were like, that ah, we're not going to do this. Um, so still working with that group, they said, you know, well, let us try and find some opportunities for you in the space as an investor. And I was like, that's great. You know, sounds fantastic. And, you know, the, the Colorado market has exploded, I'd say in the last five to 10 years, somewhere in there with, you know, some great distilleries coming online. You know, obviously we had strain of hands for years and years and years, and that was kind of the gold standard really is here in Colorado, what everybody tries to compare themselves to. And, and I shouldn't say compare themselves, but I mean, they just really established themselves. And Rob Dietrich did a fantastic job when he was there. And, you know, another guy that i um, very lucky to be associated with like Jake, but um, so anyway, started talking and hanging out at Stranahan's, going down to 291 in Colorado Springs and meeting Michael uh, down there and just learning the business and, um, you know, kind of figuring out what opportunities were there. And then that led to, you know, this is going on a couple of years, me being introduced to my two partners, Steve Shelke and Roy Milner. Um, and we were all like-minded and had a couple of meetings in Louisville 
in Atlanta to, to kind of figure out, you know, kind of kicking the tires with each, with each one of us, you know, are, are we compatible? Are we um, simpatico in, in the, our outside pursuits, but also obviously as a business interest, you know, what is it we want to do? And we all landed on, it's got to be brown water. You know, we, look, there's, there's fine tequilas and vodkas and gins and all that, but we all coalesce around brown juice. And so, you know, as the more we talked, the more we realized how in step we were with each other. And so, you know, two years ago, a couple of years ago, we started putting everything together to start Art of Alchemy. And um, this past June, finally made it to market with our, our first uh, blend one. Mm. No, I think that's exciting. You said a lot of things in there that that are really interesting. Um, and first, I want to touch base on on Colorado whiskey because I don't think it gets enough love. Uh, we just recently sat down with Michael Myers himself and not the Halloween character um, and, and talked about that. Just the explosion of whiskey and, and the relatively closeness of that community because you don't have to go too far outside of Denver, really, if you consider Denver the epicenter of Colorado. Everything's within like a four hour radius of that to get from a distillation perspective. And so, um, you know, what's that like to kind of see that boom in whiskey in a non-traditional whiskey state, right? Because I make the argument, Tennessee's great and Jack Daniels, you can't surpass it. But if I were bang for my buck tourism, like I'm going to Colorado before I go to Tennessee, that's just my personal opinion. So what's that like to kind of live that out? Yeah, you it's a, actually a really good question, and it's an interesting question for a few reasons. Number one is Colorado was known as a brewery state, and I think we surpassed Oregon at one point. I you know, think we go back and forth in Oregon and Washington State with all the breweries and stuff. So Colorado was known as a, a beer state. But, you know, hey, that's, that's fantastic. But, you know, the process is very similar, obviously. Um, it's just the aging side of it, really, when you get down to it. And so, you know, coming into the state, I moved here, uh, you know, from the South 20 years ago, and it was all about the beer. Well, then, you know, Stranahan's really just kind of blew the doors off and got such good press and uh, making incredible juice. Uh, you know, let's don't forget that. Um, and doing unique things like their snowflake, where people would camp out three days in advance and buy the, the snowflake is an expression that comes out once a year. And I think there's 750 bottles of it and people would camp out and that, you know, then people are talking about what is Stranahan's on to that people will literally camp out for Colorado single malt whiskey for days. There's got to be something to it. Well, then, you know, other guys start coming in, Leopold Brothers, uh, Woody Creek, you know, I mean, just some some really solid brands that have put Colorado on the map for for whiskey. Um, I think there's something, you know, we always, I shouldn't say we, we in the industry, let me put it that way, talk about, you know, the climate in the South and specifically Kentucky, Tennessee, and the contraction and expansion because of the four seasons there with the juice in the barrel. Well, Colorado, everybody... Thanks. You know, my my dad will call me. He lives in Orlando and he'll see something on the news about Denver being, you know, two feet under snow. And, you know, I may pick up my cell phone and I'm out shoveling the snow in shorts because it's 56 degrees the very next day. But I think everybody thinks that we're just always under a blanket of snow in the winter. Um, we have four distinct seasons here. They may not, you know, we've got a humidity difference, um, but it'll get up to, you know, over 100 degrees in the summer. And so in these Rick houses here in Colorado, they're experiencing that same expansion and contraction in the barrels. So that that juice is penetrating into the barrels. And I don't think people give us enough credit uh, for the process here and our our environment here um, and what it can do to, to make some incredible distillate. Mm. No, I, I think that that's great. I uh, I'm blown away what's happening in Colorado um, from the uniqueness of the whiskey. And I think you know, they, they lead a lot of the single malt charge too, right? Westland and, and some of that gets, it's the kind of the name brand recognition from that. But I think Colorado is leading the evolution of, of whiskey in America and American single malt. So that's really cool just to see like kind of a ground floor, you know, perspective, you know, on that. And so being from the South, right. And then, you know, hearing these ideas and kind of kicking the tires on, I'm building out a brand <laughs> 15 to 17 million to $17 million is no small feat of, of dollars. And, uh, you know, 
the age old question in business, and I'm sure you've heard this is build or buy, right? When it, when that number came back to you, was it kind of like build was out of the question and then we needed to, to, to move to that buy route and figure out, Hey, let's build a brand under the buy concept and potentially get to that. So is that a long-term plan to get back pay maybe to a, a destination or is it always going to be buy and create now? Um, well, the great thing about Art of Alchemy is that we are so small, we can, you know, we're not the big freight liner in the ocean. We're, we're a little speedboat. So we, we can be a little more nimble. We are definitely open to the idea. And we've talked about this for two years, you know, to have a bricks and mortar, um, you know, in the South somewhere. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely still a possibility for us. Um, I would say that, you know, and going back to your question about the, the Colorado market for whiskey, one of the things that I found, and it was reinforced by meeting Jim Rutledge and Steve Nally at BBC and, you know, Rutledge obviously being at Four Roses, and I'll get into Rutledge and his connection to Art of Alchemy. But what I found as I was bebopping around Colorado and meeting Michael at 291 and Dietrich at, at Stranahan's and others is it seemed to be, and I learned this later on, uh, talking to Jim Rutledge and Steve Nally, but it seemed to be like back in the day, if you will, in Kentucky and Tennessee, in that everybody was so open and willing to help. And I mean, I had a bunch of just really dumb questions. And they would just sit, Michael sat down with me for an hour, hour and a half, and just, you know, tell me what you want to do, Mac, and I'll tell you what I'm doing. And Rob Dietrich, I mean, you know, he and I used to, and Rob's now with Blackened, um, but back in the day, Rob, I would just show up at Strain of Hands, and Rob and I would literally climb over barrels in Strain of Hands' Rick House, and, you know, he would point out some of his, his favorites and stuff. And he didn't have to do that. And Michael didn't have to spend the time. It, it was that education that I got from those guys. And going back to your question that you just asked, seeing what they had to go through, and especially Michael, because being the founder and owner of 291, he's he's seen it all, you know, from startup to, to expansion and what he's doing. Um, so he was just a wealth of knowledge and kind of a sounding board for, you know, how to avoid some of the pitfalls if we were going to do, you know, our own bricks and mortar distillery, the build. Um, so it was through talking to people like that, that, you know, we really came to the decision that we were going to do the buy. Um, and look, other people are doing it basically, you know, almost every bottle, if you will. Some could argue that every bottle of whiskey or bourbon that's on a shelf is blended to some extent. We just wanted to be completely transparent in what we were doing and put it on the side ribbons that you see on the, the bottle. We want people to play with it and have fun with it. And we intentionally don't put tasting notes on our website because we want people to, everybody's different. Some people like cauliflower, some people like their steak medium rare, and some people like it well done. Who are we to tell you what you're tasting. We know what what we think it tastes like, but all three of us are even different in how we approach Art of Alchemy. So we want people to look at that side ribbon and when they taste it, we've got two two ryes in blend number one. Is that the heat from the three-year rye? Well, maybe. Or is that the, the six-year rye and then the sweet note? What is that? That must be the bourbon, right? So we just want people to play with it and have fun. Um, but that ties back into the answer for your question. We want to have fun with you when you're experiencing and hopefully enjoying Art of Alchemy. So we would love to have a tasting room, if nothing else. Um, and then eventually, hopefully leads into actually owning and operating our own still. Mm. I was going to say, let's talk about the whiskey because uh, I know very little outside of the fact that Jake uh, poured me some samples. He said, here, this is Art of Alchemy, and I was like, I like this because I, uh, I like to kind of discover the whiskey as we're doing the podcast because I think it's more original. And uh, so you're saying it's a blend of three whiskeys, two of them are rye, one of them's a bourbon. Correct. Yeah, and I okay. and I can read it to you because I I have it yep. here. So no ninety five five in this. So when you think about the the rye whiskey, uh, so it's a three year rye. 80%, 12%, eight. So 80 rye, 12 corn, eight barley. Jim Rutledge, 20 barrels. Uh, six year rye, 51, 45, four. So Kentucky style rye, uh, six years old. And then an eight year old bourbon, 75, 21, four. So it's really interesting because 
the younger rye content being that 12% corn, I think lends to like a note of sweetness, like throughout, uh, throughout the whiskey. Um, cause it, it does have a, a high corn derivative for being rye based, right? Cause I think it's, yeah, it says on the front, it's 70% rye, 30% corn. And it's not a traditional like boo rye mashup, right? Where you're getting like 50, 50 or 49, 51. It's more of a blend of straight rye whiskeys called how you see it. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah. the, the sweet note, right? Like if you're a corn whiskey drinker or a corn bourbon drinker, this would, you could lean into this one because of that, that sweet note. And, and I, I always look at Scott as being like the baseline for if he's going to like a rye because he loves corn sweetness. So like for your, your perspective, Scott, like seeing those mash bills, like you can be off putted by rye real quick. So I, I'm interested to know what you're yeah. thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the last person that would willingly just pour a 95, five rye. I, I just don't like the vegetal if I'm gonna, if I want vegetal, I'll just uh, eat something or uh, or pour, you know, make some, make a glass of uh, tea or something. But so yeah, I mean, I, I look for that sweetness, and that's one thing that is super traditional for me in all whiskeys because to me, bourbon is my most familiar whiskey. So Kentucky style ryes are right up my alley. So yeah, to hear that it, it's Kentucky style rye plus a little bit of bourbon. Uh, makes me pretty happy. So, <laughs> I mean, and it makes sense. I mean, I, I do get a lot of rye spice. There's no question about that. It, it That's the first thing that hit me up front, but then when it kind of lingers, you get that oak sweetness, the, the kind of caramelized sugar sweetness as well. But it, it doesn't, it doesn't get that, that note that I can't really stand. And it's that minty grass, you know, fresh cut grass note. So I, I think what's really interesting about this is, is the bouquet on the, on the nose, right? Not to get over nerdy, uh, and to like wash Mac out for a minute, but like what I, what I like about Buraz is it, it leans to both whiskey showing up. It doesn't really matter the blend. They're both going to show up in, in their different elements. Um, and this one from an element perspective, you get a lot of the bourbon notes through the nose and you get a lot of the rye tasting notes through the palate which balances out perfect in a way because you get most of your flavors from your nose, right? So like we, we've talked about that at nauseum, uh, like throughout the years and everyone knows that by now, but to be able to pair both of them and then be able to get those full flavors, like Scott said at the back of the palate, the finish where it's not a Kentucky hug, it's an actual palate finish. I think that's why the blend shows, shows nicely because it's, it's, it's a nice mix of both. Yeah. And that was intentional. You know, I'm sure you guys have, have been around and maybe even participated in blending sessions and it can be, it's, it's time consuming. It's arduous. arduous. <laughs> what you said the exact same word arduous. Yeah. I mean, everybody thinks, you know, that's, that is the fun. I mean, it is, it's a ton of fun to sit there and we do all of our, we do everything at Bardstown bourbon company at BBC. You'll hear me say BBC a lot. So Dan Calloway comes in with us maybe has some team members come in. And so for blend one, we actually had Rutledge, Jim Rutledge come in and sit with us. And when this blend came together on the table, it was the Eureka aha moment for us. Um, look, we know not everybody's going to like it. That's fine. You know, that's, that's just the way these things go. Um, but we were and Jim. I mean, it's his discipline, right? He laid it down at Castle and Key. He knew everything about those barrels. And when we got this blend together, like I said, it was the Eureka moment for us because of the, and I'm not trying to geek out or anything, but it's uh, my opinion. I think it's very complex. I think there's some subtle notes in here that people are going to be surprised uh, by. It's 110 proof. And I've done whiskey tastings and whiskey festivals here in Colorado and, I, you know, pour the little, uh, taster for people. And then I will literally ask them, what proof do you think that is? The closest anybody's ever come to actually getting 110 is one guy said 105. And I get everything from 90 to, to 100, but nobody has pegged it at 110. I don't think it drinks at 110. Um, but it is indeed 110 proof. So, you know, it is complex. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, hitting your nose first, it, it kind of wakens things up in you and you, you get excited to, to actually taste the juice and then you taste it. And it, there's a lot going on there. You know, there's some viscosity and 
um, lingers on the back of the tongue a little bit, but it's a, a nice, nice linger. Mm. My opinion, I may be biased. <laughs> no, I, I think the blend is, is really nice. And I think that it's got a flavor for anyone that's there. And, and, and I would agree it doesn't drink hot. So I wouldn't have said 110. I would have been more in like the probably hundred range. Um, that's just kind of where I sit, but it sits in the, in the, in the proof point that I like, especially in rise, not a huge, huge barrel proof rye fan because they can just get over spicy, uh, in a, in a hurry. Um, so I, I think this one sits in a nice flavor range to show the, the alchemist part of it, right. To be able to show the, the flavor. And for people that don't understand alchemist, like go back and listen to our episode with spirits of French lick, because Alan Bishop explains what an alchemist is, uh, very clearly on there. But yeah, I mean, it, it's really that idea of creating that, that blend, uh, the amalgamation of, of whiskey. And I, I think it's, it's really unique. Uh, and that's what, what I like about it. Cause it doesn't taste like everything I've had on the shelf. And that's what a lot of people do. They get a brand and they just, it's 95, five, or it's common mash bill. And they just throw it out there and make up a story. This has like yeah. some character behind it. Yeah. That, you know, once again, that was intentional in the name art of alchemy. Look, there's, you know, sitting, sitting down in a blending session or, or, you know, taking a risk on buying blending barrels or taking a risk on buying the, the Rutledge barrels. You know, of course, you're tasting these as you go along and you're doing your homework. But, you know, th- with the way barrels are going and being priced right now, sometimes you don't even get the opportunity to taste them. They're like, if you want them, you know, send us the money and we'll ship you the barrels. And um, not not that, you know, you want you don't want to do that. You want to obviously taste those barrels before you buy them. Um, but one of the great things of having this partnership and relationship with BBC is they are getting stuff all the time. And if there's something that comes across their desk that doesn't really meet uh, with what they're planning for the ne- their next release, they may throw it to us or one of their other uh, people that they're doing contract bottling for. So, you know, we've got the luxury of being, you know, tied to this big, uh, very successful and, and rightfully so uh, distillery. And we get to kind of ride on their coattails a little bit as far as some of the barrels that they're finding, which is the art. The alchemy is kind of twofold. It is the alchemy. It is sitting down and doing the blending sessions. And um, it is, you know, what do we have in the, you know, the mash bill and what proof do we want to land at? And so there is the chemistry side to that, if you will. But the alchemy, as we tell our story, is really about what we're doing. There's three guys right now sitting, you know, one's in Colorado, two are in Kentucky, and we're sitting here coming together over a glass of brown juice. And that's the way we really tell our story. And I said it earlier, we would love to have a tasting room because we'd love to be able to have these experiences with people in person. And I don't care if it's at a wedding or a wake or, you know, whatever it is, I've never heard anybody say, you know, oh, you remember at grandpa's funeral, we were having that great glass of vodka. Um, It just, those stories don't, don't really happen. It's, you know, Hey, we, we popped open that, that bottle of, uh, you know, insert the name here that, that grandpa had been saving for 50 years and we toasted him at his funeral with that whiskey or that bourbon. Um, and so we want to be a part of those stories, you know, or, you know, just have a seat at the table. Look, we didn't solve a problem by bringing another whiskey to market. Um, we just want to offer an option. And I think, you know, Jake, you said it, it's, I think it is unique to, a lot of stuff out there on on the shelves and that's what we wanted to do is just present an option if you like it drink it you know if you don't no harm no foul um so that's kind of where we landed with the art of alchemy so do the three of you have similar taste profiles i mean mm, I, I know how difficult it could be to come up with a consensus whenever you're blending 50 barrels or whatever it is or you know 20 different options um, the quick answer kind of, is no. Yeah. Is this um, kind of somebody won out and then maybe batch two is going to be, Hey, look, we're going to go this way. We're going to kind of steer. Cause we've experienced that with just picking single barrels. Uh, <laughs> and that's hard enough. You know, we, we talk about why we like it and maybe you can campaign and convince somebody that <laughs> this is why this is the winner. Not, not what you originally thought. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so like I said, the, the quick answer is no, you know, um, we've all got our things that we, we gravitate towards. 
for example, Stace really, uh, he, he enjoys wine a lot. So that influences how he approaches, you know, what we're doing. Um, Roy started a brewery, you know, so his palate is nuanced to to that realm. But when we come together, I think that's the beauty. That's the, the alchemy and the art is we come together and somebody may say, you know, and I'm blend to I'm trying to remember there was one blend that we did and all of us put our glasses down and we're basically like, hell no. Yeah. It, it's not it's it's not that it's bad it's just like this isn't this isn't anything that we would enjoy drinking at grandpa's funeral um let alone just sipping one after work um but what we do is we just kind of come to a consensus and we're you're not going to win out all the time and um with this one we just maybe it was beginner's luck i don't know but it, it just everything was aligned and all of us were aligned and then having jim there to, you know, reinforce what we were tasting, what we were sensing, um, you know, it just, we're all like, you know, this is, this is where we, we landed in a good spot. Uh, blend two was a little more difficult. We were trying some, some, you know, not out there things like a quinoa or anything like that, but uh, we tried some Canadian uh, uh, blends and we were losing them in the rye. They just got lost in that, that rye. And you have to keep in mind of the, the label will change. The ribbons will change on blend too, because our baby, our Rutledge baby uh, barrels had a birthday. So they're four years old now for blend two. Um, so that's going to change, you know, how we approach our blending as well Is our base juice, the, the Rutledge barrels age, we can, we can experiment a little more and do some, some more creative things with it. Mm. I like the I like the fact that your stocks are getting older so you can do a little bit different things. And then I I love the fact that you all are humble enough to say it takes a village um and partner with people like Jim. Like that's why he's got 50 plus years of experience, right? To to use that and and give that to people and sometimes I think people go, "You know what? I'm really good about whiskey. I don't need help." Like the, the best people in whiskey need help, right? If you think back to any conversation, going back to our conversation with Jack Daniels, even like Jack needed uncle nearest, right? Like, like all of these things like needed near screen, all of these things add up to like the bourbon industry and the whiskey industry. When people need something, they lend out a hand. And so don't be arrogant enough to try to do it by yourself because you're not going to do it better than people have been doing it their whole damn life. Right. And that's, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, when I first met Jim, it was at BBC and he brought a bunch of samples from his barrels. And so Roy and I met with Jim there in the lobby of BBC. And if you've never been there, it's amazing and beautiful and everything. And we're sitting there and, um, oh, you guys are going to have to help me. What's the gas station with the crazy sausage biscuits? Oh, with Jake's sausage um, right down the way. Jake's. Jake's quick stop or something. Yeah. And, and they have Jake's sausage. Yeah. It's easy for me yeah. to remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I stop and get, we get a sack full of these uh, sausage biscuits that are just to die for. Um, but anyway, we sit down and Jim's like, yeah, you know, I already had breakfast. So we start getting into it, but the sack still got a, a biscuit in it that he hadn't eaten. And we're talking and then Steve Nally comes over, who's now at BBC. And these two have known each other forever. And they start just having this very casual conversation in front of Roy and I. And at one point, I can't remember which one it was, but one of them, either Steve needed a pump or Jim needed to pump their pump broke at their distillery. And so Jim calls Steve, I'll say, and says, hey, man, our pump just went down. You know, can you help me? And Steve's like, yeah, I'm sitting here looking at one. It's sitting over here on a pallet. And Jim's like, OK, I'll send somebody over to get it. And, Jim, and Steve's like, nope, I've already got my guys loading up on a truck. They'll bring it over to you. I mean, and these are competitors, right? And that goes back to what I was talking about with Michael here and, and Rob Dietrich, and then it being confirmed that this is a space, an industry will, where people, for the most part, are genuinely interested in helping and seeing you succeed. I can't think of a brand that I could bad mouth and say, oh my gosh, that's jet fuel, don't buy it. You know, they're, everybody's out there doing their thing, and I wish everybody the best. And we're just a small player in that world, but we have benefited greatly from the experience of people like Jim and Steve, Rob Dietrich, Michael, 
Colin. I know you had Colin on from uh, uh, Kings County. Yep. I talked to him really early on and, you know, he and I were geeking out on a phone call one time and I was once again, just asking a million questions about the build prospect for us. And um, so it's just, I mean, he's in New York. I'm in Colorado. Steve's in Kentucky and Rob's here in Colorado. It's just, you know, it's, it's a fraternity or a sorority or depending on who's you know, you're talking to, it's just a tight knit group of people and they're fun. And we just want to have fun with you all, you know, the consumers, the, the people in the industry, it, it should be fun. You're drinking whiskey. Yeah. Now, to be honest, the more, the more we sit here and the more we drink this, the better the whiskey is like it opens up. It's got some creme brulee. It's like, you know, mm. it's got some of those toasted characteristics and the rye starts to fade and the, the sweetness and the dessertness of the, the whiskey starts to shine. So if you do buy a bottle, if you found a bottle, like one, this is a whiskey, a drop of water would probably be great in this just to let the oils open up because rye is really open up with, with that. So really cool, cool drink. Like that's what I appreciate is, is having a, a drink that's fun. Like it's got elements to it. Uh, it's not just a one trick pony that, you know, once you drink it, it's the same. This one kind of opens up and does a little f- few different things. Yeah. And it's funny you should say that because, um, you know, it was with somebody the other day talking about, you know, at, took a bottle over to a, a friend's house who was having a dinner party and, um, one of the guys is kind of a, a whiskey guy like we are. And he's like, you know, I got to try it. I got to try it. I hadn't seen this guy since we'd been in market. And we sat there and I get, I got a little solo cup and put some ice cubes in it. And, you know, had the, the highball with the whiskey in it, just neat. And he's like, well, how do you want me to drink this? And I said, how do you want to drink it? You know, that's not, you know, I said, but I, you know, I would appreciate it if you just tried it neat. And then I brought the ice for you. Um, and he tried it neat and he's like, I don't even need the ice. And then he came back and had a second glass and he's like, now I'm going to try it with the ice. And to your point, Jake, he was like, man, this, this really kind of came to life when I put one little ice cube in there. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what we want people to do is we want people to, you know, have the bottle out on the table with you and look at that side panel with the ribbons that tells you what's in there. And and my takes, is that the the young rye, the older rye? Is that the bourbon? You know, what am I doing? Let's put some water in there and see what happens. Mm. Definitely. So Scott, you, you've been awful quiet tonight. Like, you know, I saw you just pour some more. So like, what are, what are, what are your yeah. changing thoughts on this as we, we continue to chat? I'm just trying to figure it out really. Cause <laughs> it is, it is very unique. And like when I first tasted it, it was like peppercorns. Mm. Like it was like a pop of like crushed black pepper. And then now that it sat here and it was in the glass for a little bit, it did get a lot more desserty, more, uh, I wrote down like, figs and raisins like it it's more like deeper fruit notes mm. and um so yeah i think i'm just trying to figure it out i really the people that are listening literally it's the first time i've smelled it looked at a bottle <laughs> maybe that sounds unprofessional but sometimes i like to not be prepared but it makes for an engaging conversation because then you know we're reacting as we as we do it right like that's live action live action <laughs> yeah no, nah, I mean, that's another Kentucky boy right there. Live action. Haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> so, Mac, you made a comment about these Rutledge barrels. Obviously, you've got a supply of them, so you're going to let them age and use it as a component of some blends in the future. Is that, will that always be the case? Or do you think, I mean, obviously, eventually, you're going to run out of, of of that whiskey. Do you plan on, you know, exploring more bourbon heavy um, mash bills or, you know, is, is, are you just kind of letting kind of the wind take you where you go and, you know, see where, where your blending techniques evolve? A great question. And it, yeah, we're kind of letting, we're just blowing in the wind to some extent. I mean, you know, we've got a forecast from a business perspective and in our model and, you know, when at this run rate, you know, if we're using 20, Rutledge barrels each release. When do we run out, et cetera, et cetera? Um, do we want to do single barrel? Do we want to do barrel proof? You know, whatever it is. So these are all things that we put in in to the hopper, if you will, and bat around uh, with us as the owners. Um, I would say that you know we've got um, the opportunity to potentially go out and buy 
50 barrels of a weeded if we wanted to and see how that plays with maybe not even blending any rye into it, but doing a, a different style. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, looking at different finishing barrels, um, you know, that could be rum, it could be wine, it, who knows? Um, so we're just, we're playing right now and it's, it's serious business. It's serious money. Um, but you know, and Jake said it earlier, look, we are 100% completely humble about what we're doing. And, you know, as we're moving along and looking at finishing barrels, we're not going to try and do this on our own. You know, we're going to talk to Rob Dietrich. We're going to talk to BBC and what's your experience been and how long should we keep them in there? Is it four months? Is it a year? Is it six months? Where's the sweet spot? Well, obviously our juice is different. So it may be six months, but their experience was four months. Well, we'll know when we get the thief out and do some sampling and stuff. Um, but, you know, right now we're just having fun and kind of um, we're, we're borderless. We can go in any direction we want to. Um, we will continue to use the the Rutledge barrels there in blend number two. Um, so, you know, that's that's the base on blend two as well. Um, but, you know, after blend two gets to market, then we're really going to start kind of experimenting. We're curious. All three of us are curious by nature. And this is a great space to be curious in and see what you can do and not not push boundaries and in the envelope and do, you know, just crazy off the wall stuff, but within the confines of, you know, air quoting here, you know, kind of your normal, more, um, you know, flavor profiles, that's where we'll play probably usually, but that certainly doesn't mean we couldn't do something totally out of left field. Yeah. And I, I think it's very interesting because it's, it's like a spin on that independent bottler that's, getting more popular in America again. I mean, it was always popular way back when, when there was like 15 producers and everybody else was, was buying and repackaging or, you know, whatever. But this is like a spin on that because it's not just bottling a single bottling or a single mash bill. It's, it's blending multiples. And it reminds me of like American mashing grain and yep. lost lantern. Yep. And they do that. I mean, they do a lot of single barrels too, but um, just, blending those unique characteristics to a, a flavor profile that fits their characteristics. And and I just want to say one other thing before we jump in. Sorry, Mac. Like if you've never blended anything, like it takes cojones grande to put out something that you think is good with little to no feedback other than the people that help you blend it. Like it is damn unnerving until you see that people buy it. So congratulations just on having some balls. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, um, I mean, that certainly was part of our discussions. You know, this is, this is our baby and we're putting it in a bottle. And what if nobody likes it? You know, we have to have thick skin. I think everybody in the industry does um, because, you know, once again, it's just not going to be everybody's flavor profile and that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it was a huge leap. I mean, you know, we buy the barrels. We like them. You know, Jim's proud of them. And you also have to keep in mind, this was the first time Jim Rutledge ever made a rye. You know, 27 years at, you know, his last post at Four Roses, Four Roses doesn't make a rye. So when Jim, you know, went to Castle and Key and laid down all these barrels of rye, you know, and word got out, you know, it was, there was a lot of buzz about them and rightfully so. Um, we're not the only ones that use the Rutledge rye. Um, and everybody that's using it is, doing pretty darn well with it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's a leap of faith to be sure. Um, you know, we've all done other, myself, Roy and Stave, we, we've done other things in our lives professionally and to, to kind of just, you know, go all chips on the table and say, we're going to bring another whiskey to, to market and cross our fingers. And the reception that we've had to blend one has been very positive. Um, so, you know, we're, we're proud of this baby. Yeah. And, and to be honest, like, that's what you should be. Like we've blended a single barrel for Penelope and it was mm -hmm. hard and it takes time, energy and effort. Um, so, you know, just kudos to you all. Um, so, you know, as, as you all go, right, like you all have these stocks and, you know, blend two is out. Um, you know, talk a little bit, I think the, the part that people don't know is the sourcing of barrels, 
right? Like, and how difficult it is. It's not easy. So can you talk, like pull that veil back a little bit on what that looks like from a, a sourcing of, of barrels? Because barrel production is, is really hard to come by. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. If you're going to be an NDP, like we are a non-distilling producer. Um, so we are once again, full of transparency, we go out and find unique um, flavorful barrels and purchase them and bring them back to BBC and then start playing with them and the alchemy kicks in and the art kicks in. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's across the board and I don't care who you are. If you want barrels, you got to pay to play. And, um, you know, I think the, the average now, depending on your distillery, if you put new make into a barrel, that barrel is worth about 750, maybe $850. Well, you come back to that same barrel a year later, that barrel is almost doubled in value. And obviously it keeps going up and up. Um, so, you know, it kind of flattens out, but you're also getting less juice out of that barrel every year. So, you know, and you're, you never know until you open it up, how much you're going to get out of it and harvest. Um, so finding barrels and finding barrels at the price point that we're playing in, um, you know, it's different for every producer. Um, some producers can afford a thousand ten thousand dollar barrels you know whatever their price point is so everybody's got their their own business model that they're following for us we're looking for five maybe ten blending barrels um which can be difficult because you know some of these bigger uh barrel brokers if you will are looking to sell in the hundreds so when we come knocking and say hey we want to make something up five barrels of a weeded bourbon they're like not worth our time to do that transaction um, but that's where it goes back to the alchemy and the friendships and the relationships that we've built. Some people will talk to us just because they like what we're doing and they're intrigued by what we're doing. They're like, yeah, we've got five barrels of a weeded, you know, you want to come sample them or, you know, send you samples or whatever. Um, so we've got an entree into some some avenues that maybe some other people don't. I mean, like I said, you know, the, the industry is pretty open and friendly. Um, I don't not trying to make the claim that we have, you know, all these um barrels out there that nobody's ever heard of and they're you know in somebody's cellar basement and they've been aging there for 15 years um we just we've got some people that like what we're doing and want to see us succeed and be supportive so but finding barrels is you can find them but are you willing to pay to play yep uh it's a commodity it's a commodity yeah bourbon has turned into the byproduct of of corn and, and other, other products, right? It's basically a gas, uh, gasoline fuel, yeah. <laughs> uh, until it goes into the barrel and starts to even out. And no, I think it's really interesting. I, I think a lot of people just don't understand that part. There's like, Oh, MGP. Well, newsflash for everyone listening to this podcast, MGP's dried up a little bit. <laughs> uh, and, if you don't know somebody, it's getting harder and harder and harder. And, and like you said, the consultants, they want to deal with big round numbers. They don't want to deal with small, small figures. So it, it is, it's hard. And and you all are doing something unique. And I think that's what the difficulty is, is we need continued unique product because Gen Z Gen and, and millennials, right. Their flavor profiles continue to adapt and grow. And like, you know, your dad's bourbon uh, or your granddad's whiskey is, is not always what those kids want to have. And I think that's why you see brands pushing the envelope, American single malt, finished whiskeys, different barrel finishes. Like it's because the younger generation don't, doesn't necessarily want to drink dad's whiskey or granddad's whiskey. Well, I think to that point, Jake, there's, there's something else at play there and we know this and it's being studied, you know, with social media. And I don't know, we'll maybe we'll put an age you know, 35 and under those people grew up with different technology and my kids, I've got three kids, 16, 15 and 13, their attention span is less than that of a gnat. Right. Because they're on TikTok all the time and there's a new video every 15 to 45 seconds. So they are literally transitioning from one thing after another. You know, it, it, we're talking about minutes, you know, so something for an hour for them to sit down and attend to and give it all their attention is becoming. And like I said, this is being studied. It's becoming very difficult for them. I say that 
to make the point that that's what we're seeing in the industry as well. You know, our grandfather drank Jack and Coke and that's what was on the bar. He drank it for 50, 60 years, however long, you know, that was. And that was his thing. And if you say, hey, I brought you a bottle of Makers, Mark. Hey, take it home. I only drink Jack. Well, this younger generation that we're experiencing now, they want something new and fresh and different, you know, more often. So I think the industry as a whole has to start and is to some extent playing into that. And rightfully so, you know, we've got to come out with more expressions annually, biannually, whatever it is, because they may drink Art of Alchemy for three months and then they're going to move on to, you mentioned Penelope or Kings County or uh, Castle and Key. They're just going to keep fluttering around. So what we have to do is, is play that game as well and come up with unique blends, you know, at least two, at least twice a year. Um, hopefully we get to the point where we can do three, four uh, blends a year and, and do some of those unique things that I was talking about, Scott, you know, a, a finishing barrel, um, you know, maybe a single barrel drop or a barrel proof or something like that. So, no, I think this is cool. And I, I think this is to Scott's point, it's the next wave of independent bottling. Right. Um, and then it gives you opportunity to, to do whatever you all want. Like if, if Art of Alchemy grows up and they want to have a distillery, there you go. There's your opportunity. If Art of Alchemy just wants to continue blending and sourcing, guess what? You've already created a niche. So I think it's a great story. I think this is what American ingenuity is all about. And so I appreciate you rolling up your sleeves and and doing something that takes courage because not everyone has, you know, what I said earlier, uh, to go out here and, and do that. Uh, so super unique whiskey. I'm going to keep it on my bar. Uh, I think it'll be a fun whiskey to do cocktails in as well. Um, so man, Mac, keep you and the partners, keep up doing what you're doing. Cause this is, this is really cool. And, and I'm really proud to, to have you all on, uh, because this is a great story. Well, thank you a ton. And, uh, proud to be able to share the story. And, and like I said, at the beginning, appreciate the time. And, um, we just want to have fun with, with the actual juice. And we want to have fun with the people that are drinking it, whether it's around a fire pit or at a wedding or whatever it is. We want to want to be a part of that little part of that story. For sure. So uh, as we close up here, can you give our listeners uh, just more information on where they can find out uh, about purchasing a bottle and then more about where they can find out and where can they find out more about Art of Alchemy? Sure. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, we are in the process of redoing our website. I'm sure you've heard that before, <laughs> um, but ho hopefully by the end of the month, it's up and it live. We do have a page right now, but it's aoaspirits.com. We're also on uh, Instagram, uh, same thing, at aoaspirits. Um, and I should, you know, once again, in full transparency, we're in seven states right now, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Colorado, and Texas. Um, but we are online, you know, doing sales, uh, DTC through Sealbox. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully people can find it. Awesome. Well, we truly appreciate the opportunity for, for you joining the Bourbon Lens tonight. And, uh, we look forward to seeing what y'all are going to be doing here in the future. Thank you. Really appreciate the time. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the bourbon lens. We truly appreciate your time. As always, you can find out more about us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at bourbon lens. If you want to become part of our community, go over to patreon.com backslash bourbon lens and join our growing community there. And we cannot say thank you enough for the team that joined us uh, in February for our uh, tasting with the Dalmore. So Ryan and Brandon and Corey, and John and Michael and everyone else. Uh, thank you again for your patronage. And last but not least, please go over to your favorite podcast listening app and give us a five-star review or a comment. We truly appreciate it. And until next time, cheers.